everyone. Welcome to another video from Kinesthetic Knowledge. Today's video is focusing on the basics and intro to fascia with a very special collaboration featuring Aya. Hello, everyone. I'll be talking about applying concepts of fascia in our everyday life, where I'm going to give an introduction about force transmission and balance. All right, so let's get into it. Fascia, similar to ligaments and tendons, is also soft tissue, which is composed primarily of collagen fibers, and it plays a vital role in the structural integrity and functional coordination of our human body. So by general definition, if you haven't heard about it before, fascia encompasses the extracellular matrix, ECM, and cells, and it forms a three-dimensional network that surrounds, supports, and connects muscular uh, muscular, skeletal, and visceral components. And this soft tissue component of the connective tissue system forms a continuous, so there's no breaking, continuous whole body matrix known as the fascial system, and it permeates throughout the entire body. And, um, fascia's interactions with muscles, nerves, blood vessels, and organs really highlights its integral role in the body's structural and functional integration. Um, very recently, the definition of fascia has been broadened to include all collagenous-based soft tissues in the body, which also includes the cells that create and maintain the extracellular matrix. And so um, let's start off with a little bit of the classification system of fascia. As I mentioned earlier, fascia has multiple layers, and it can be classified as superficial, deep, visceral, or parietal, and then further classified according to its anatomical location. So for today's video, let's actually learn about it going from outside to inside, which means we'll start by looking at superficial fascia. So superficial fascia is actually found directly under the skin and the superficial adipose layers, and it is synonymous with the hypodermis or the inner layer of the skin. Traditionally, it is described as being made up of membranous layers with loosely packed interwoven collagen and elastic fibers. Superficial fascia is thicker in the trunk than in the limbs, and then it becomes thinner peripherally, so as you move away from the trunk, it becomes thinner. Superficial fascia layers can sometimes include muscle fibers to create all types of structures in the body, and a few examples of superficial uh, fascia include the platysma muscle in the neck and the external anal sphincter. Uh, now moving to the next layer, we have deep fascia. So deep fascia actually surrounds the bones, muscles, nerves, and blood vessels, and it commonly has a more fibrous consistency and is rich in hyaluronin as compared to the other subtypes. I'll talk about hyaluronin in just a little bit, but deep fascia tends to be highly vascularized and it contains well-developed lymphatic channels. And in some instances, deep fascia can actually also contain free encapsulated nerve endings. So what these nerve endings can do is they can provide sensation. So they make you feel sensitive to painful stimuli. They make you feel sensitive to temperature, hot and cold, and also to touch or vibrations. And when we consider deep fascia, there's actually two different subtypes. First, you have aponeurotic fascia. So this type of fascia, fascia actually forms into sheets of pearly white fibrous tissue, and it will attach to muscles needing a wide area of attachment. And so aponeurosis, which you may have heard of, can actually thin into a tendon and become a point of origin or insertion for other muscles. And so some examples of aponeurotic fascia include the fascia of your limbs, the thoracolumbar fascia, and the rectus sheath. Um, and According and in comparison to the other two subtypes, um, aponeurotic fascia actually um, is thicker and it is normally easily separated from the underlying muscle and it is comprised of two to three parallel collagen fibers. The other subtype of deep fascia is known as epimesial fascia, also known as epimesium. And so this is a connective tissue sheath surrounding skeletal muscle, and then it can, in some cases, actually connect directly to the periosteum of the bones. And there are a couple of different major muscle groups that are enveloped in epimesium. So these can include muscles of the trunk, your pectoralis major, your trapezius, your deltoid, and also your gluteus maximus. In comparison to epineurotic fascia, it is actually thinner and it's actually more tightly connected to the muscle. And it actually does this um, via the septa or the layers uh, of the muscle that penetrate uh, muscle layers. The next layer we actually have is visceral fascia. And similar to how we have visceral um, linings, visceral fascia surrounds organs and cavities like the abdomen, the lung, so your pleura, and heart, the pericardium. And then lastly, we have parietal fascia. And parietal fascia is a general term for tissues that basically line the wall of a body cavity just outside of the parietal layer of the serosa. And the most commonly known parietal fascia that you may have heard of is actually found in the pelvis. 
So now that we know a little bit about where we can find fascia, the different layers and its anatomical structures, um, from what I've just shared, you might think that fascia is a little bit more passive structurally, but it actually is very active. What it does is that it provides support for surrounding tissues, it helps reduce friction, and it plays a supportive role for the tissues and organs. And so if you remember, I mentioned deep fascia and how it is very dynamic because it has crucial roles in both protection and mobility. So we have deep fascia, which is actually histologically rich in cells and nervous tissue. Um, and deep fascia is adept at adapting to various metabolic and me uh, mechanical demands. And then within its matrix, you can actually find hyaluronin. And if you remember from our previous content, it plays a vital role in facilitating smooth movement between the fascial layers and between deep fascia and also the underlying muscle. So hyaluronin is concentrated on the inner surface of the deep fascia. It interacts with the muscle's epimesium, creating a lubricating layer, which is essential for seamless movement. However, if you have disruptions in the connective tissue surrounding the muscles, this can actually disrupt this interface of hyaluronin. And what that does is that it hinders this facial gliding that we have. Um, in some Past research by Fade, um, this uh, they reveal that variations in hyaluronin content across body sites actually correlates with the degree of fascial movement. So there are certain regions that require more lubrication, such as your synovial joints and your mobile joint associated fascia. And so in this region, you'll actually have higher hyaluronin concentrations, so you have better movement. So in a healthy state, fascia is relaxed and is wavy connective tissue, but this relaxed state can lose its malleability when it is damaged by a local trauma or inflammation. And then this can cause fascial layers to tighten and restrict the movement of underlying tissues, which can lead to pain, hindered range of motion, and decreased blood flow. And so one interesting thing that I want to end off before I pass it on to Aya is how there are also sensory nerves that innervate the fascial tissue. The deep fascia specifically is extensively innervated with multiple sensory nerve subtypes. And so this is um, not limited to, but does include nociceptors, thermoreceptors, chemoreceptors, also proprioceptors and mechanoreceptors. And so um, when we focus on proprioceptors and mechanoreceptors, the purpose of proprioceptors is primarily to give detailed and continuous information about the pos position of your limbs and other body parts in space. And mechanoreceptors are special nerve cells that turn movement into signals when they're, and then when they're stimulated, they take muscles around a joint, they contract quickly, and they help your body to react to sudden movements. So this just kind of give you, gives you context as to how fascia is really involved in movement. And I'll be passing on to Aya now. Thank you, Manur. So on the topic of movement, I would like to ask a couple of questions just to get us thinking. What structures do you think come into play when you're kicking a soccer ball or swinging a bat? You may be thinking about one or two structures that move when you're doing these movements, but actually there are so many structures that come into play. For instance, if you're kicking a soccer ball, it's not just one leg that is moving, but also the other leg is stabilizing you so you don't fall. Another question is, if you woke up with back pain or shoulder pain, what do you think the reason for that may be? You could give a lot of reasons, but have you ever thought that maybe the origin of pain is somewhere else in the body? Maybe your back pain has to do with your pelvis or your hip muscles? Let's delve into the compensation force transmission and gait during walking, which are all connected to fascia. To do so, let us explore something called the Anatomy Trains Myofascial Meridian Map. It reveals how pain in one area, like the neck, could stem from imbalances in the pelvis, or how lower back pain may have to do with the fallen arc of your foot. These trains represent connections within the facial fabric of the body, potential lines of pole that distribute strain, transmit force, and influence structure and function. The trains possess myofascial force transmission in stabilizing movement and in postural compensation from one myofascial unit to another to construct our map. So what we do is basically look for fiber direction and facial plane level. So basically it's alignment of facial direction with the rest of the fibers. For example, there is something called the spiral line, as you can see from the picture here, 
which is responsible for modulating rotation and oblique movements in gait and sport. Alternatively, the superficial back line that goes from your toes to your knees brings your eyes up and lifts your body to make it upright. This makes you posturally stable. If one of these lines, basically your anatomy train lines, is too weak, another line will have to compensate. But that compensation is not proper because the structures are not all moving the way they should be moving or functioning the way they should be functioning. This means that you will have bad form or bad posture. For instance, weak anatomy train lines mean that a yoga pose is performed in the wrong way. The woman on the right has a left spiral line from the left anterior superior iliac spine passing down and under her right rib cage to the right scapula and left side of her head. That is neat. This line is in need of some strengthening to bring the right ribs further forward and allow the twist in the torso to straighten. The transegrity model here is a demonstration of the nature of balance in the facial tension archive. If one structure is distributed, is disturbed, sorry, other structures may be affected as well. But why go too far with our examples when we can just mention walking, a fundamental human movement which highlights the significance of facial structures? The dense fascia lata stabilizes the hip during walking, running, and hopping, while passive resting tension within the myofacial system helps us with postural stability. Let us look at an illustration of superficial muscles. You may be wondering, should we not be more concerned about muscles rather than fascia? Well, it's important to consider that muscles transmit 40% of their contraction forces not through their tendons, but via facial con connections to neighboring muscles. Some examples include your gluteus maximus, which communicates with your lower leg muscles through the facial lata, and the latissimus dorsi engages with the contralateral gluteus maximus via the lumbodorsal fascia. Even normal standing results in the flattening of plantar fascia, which acts akin to a sprain. So let's focus on the iliotibial tract. This helps with your pelvic stabilization and posture control. In some athletes, repetitive reflection and extension of the knee causes the distal iliotibial band to become irritated and inflamed, resulting in diffused lateral knee pain. Iliotibial band syndrome can cause significant morbidity and lead to cessation of exercise. In MRI studies, it shows that patients with iliotibial band syndrome have thickened and, potential, and the potential space deep to the iliotibial band over the femoral epi epicondyle becomes inflamed and filled with fluid. So while we may identify facial structures separately, they're inherently connected. Consider the knee, which has outer layers maintaining a facial continuity from skin to bone. Achieving balance is crucial because too much laxity can lead to joint instability and misalignment, while excessive stiffness localizes the strain and potentially causing ligament tears. Furthermore, joint laxity prompts compensatory responses from your body. Utilizing the myofacial system as straps to counter increased movement. Understanding that all body motions are governed by myofacial chains underscores the importance of addressing weakness within the entire muscle chain rather than isolated muscles. Chronic overuse or poor form in exercises, like the yoga positions that we mentioned before, may stem from muscle tension or facial adhesions within linked chains of structures, and this imbalance can disrupt force distribution leading to strains and injuries. Thank you so much, Aya. We really hope you learned a lot today about the basics of fascia, as well as its interconnection with movement, as well as a myofascial system. That's all from Kinesthetic Knowledge. See you all next time.